Thank you very much for joining us at the UN University headquarters in Tokyo. My name is David Malone. I have the privilege of working here. And today in Tokyo, we have a terrific guest who will be engaging in a public conversation later in the day. But we thought to give you an idea of the sorts of things that go on in the university. It would be great if she'd agree to answer two or three of the questions that may arise uh, later in the day. We have with us Margaret Macmillan, who's a great historian, a uh, best-selling historian, but who is also a very great scholar. Uh, she is the warden of St. Anthony's College at Oxford University. Uh, prior to that, uh, she was the head of Trinity College at the University of Toronto for a number of years. She taught at Ryerson University. Uh, she has taught, in fact, all over the world. Currently, she's teaching at Oxford University as well as leading St. Anthony's College, which many of you will know is the college most associated with the study of international relations writ large, including its historical dimension. Recently, she published a book on uh, the antecedents of the First World War, how the First World War came about. Uh, ten years or so ago, uh, she published a book on the peace negotiations that followed the end of the war. So these two books I think of as an extraordinary set of bookends uh, to the First World War, which some of us think of as really the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. The most recent book is called The War That Ended Peace, and uh, it's done extraordinarily well. Uh, Margaret, thank you so much for taking the time while you're in Tokyo uh, to come over and speak with us. I wanted to ask you why, having written Paris 1919 on the Versailles negotiations and everything around them and, and the treaty that, that, that followed, uh, you decided to go back to the very beginning of the First World War. Well, I suppose the First World War was always there in what I was writing about the peace conference. It was the great fact that overshadowed the peace conferences, why they were there, and it was very much in their minds. And much of the world had already been turned upside down by that war. And so I was aware of and very interested in the war. What also happened is a publisher came to me about six years ago and said, we would like you to do a book on the origins of the First World War for the anniversary in 2014, and, and I thought at first I wouldn't be interested. I said, no, really, I'm not interested. I've got other plans. And then I kept thinking about it, and I realized that as a historian of the modern world, I can't really get away from the First World War. It has always been there, much more in my life than, than simply writing about the Paris Peace Conference at the end of the war. And so I'm more, the more I thought about it, the more I thought this is a subject I'd really like to tackle. It's one of the great historical mysteries of the 20th century. Why on earth did the European nations do this to themselves and to Europe? And so that's why I did it. And having uh, read Paris 1919, it struck me uh, on reading uh, The War That Ended Peace that none of the principal actors had any idea of how it might end and how it did end. Well, the tragedy, I mean, there were many tragedies in the First World War. Um, all those individual tragedies, the lives lost, the families destroyed. But one of the tragedies of the First World War was that they really didn't think through what they were doing. I think they, they blundered. I said, when I say they, I mean the European statesmen, those who made the decisions. I think they blundered into the war thinking it would be short, thinking it would be decisive. And then they found themselves in a war of stalemate, which dragged on and consumed the lives of literally millions of their men and consumed their wealth and, and shook their societies. And as the war dragged on, I think they became so fixated on, on surviving and attempting to win or attempting to avoid defeat that they didn't really think clearly about what sort of world would lie beyond the war, what, what the world would be like. I mean, they had some war aims, and of course, the longer the war went on, the bigger those aims got because they felt they ought to get something out of it. But I don't think they were really thinking very clearly about the peace when they were fighting the war. 
And uh, what went wrong specifically in 1914 that could have prevented the war? I think what happened in 1914 was a combination of three things. There were tensions that had been building up, and that had left both bitter memories. It, there'd been a series of crises which some sides had, had done better out of than others. Some had, people had had to back down. And so you had people saying, look, this time we're not backing down. And that was true of Russia, and then that was true, I think, of, of Austria-Hungary as well. But I think what also happened in 1914 was an accident. I think accidents matter sometimes a lot in history. The Archduke, the heir to the throne of Austria-Hungary, went to Sarajevo. An assassination attempt took place. He escaped the first time. He was leaving town. His car took the wrong turning. It was sitting there still, and one of the assassins jumped up and, and killed him. Without that accident, I think Austria-Hungary would not have had the excuse it needed and wanted to try and, and bring Serbia under control or even destroy it. And so I do think that little accident actually made possible a lot that followed. And then the third thing is that people made decisions, and they made bad decisions. Austria-Hungary, or the key people in Austria-Hungary, decided to try and destroy Serbia. Germany promised to back Austria-Hungary. Even knowing that Russia might come in, Russia decided to back Serbia. And so you have a cascading effect as a result, in my view, of very bad decisions. And some of those alliances, in a way, had echoes in more recent history in the Balkans, a uh, hundred years uh, later, or yeah. nearly a hundred years later, with the Russian Federation lining up more yeah. or less with Serbia all over again. Yeah. Well, the danger, I think, of, of, of troubled parts of the world, of course, is that they're, they're a terrible menace to their own people, but they also run the risk of drawing in outside powers. And the Balkans, because of where it was, it's a crossroads mm. between the southwest of Europe and Asia, um, very, very important uh, part of the world strategically, and it meant that outside powers were interested in it. And the other danger is, of course, when you get great powers backing small powers or being patrons of small powers, they're caught in a funny sort of way, and they protect these small powers, but they've got to then step up and look after them if something begins to go wrong. Mm. And so it often makes the smaller powers reckless. I think Serbia was more reckless in the way it behaved, knowing that Russia was behind it, and Russia felt itself obliged as a great power to stick up for Serbia. So it was a very dangerous combination of factors. Now, um there are two books you wrote in between these books because you've been very busy indeed. One was a fantastic account of the visit of President Nixon to China uh, and what prepared the visit. And you had two extremely controversial figures coming together, yeah. Nixon and uh, Mao. This was something completely different from your earlier writing, and I wanted to ask you what caused you to become interested and then write this fabulous account. That's very kind of you. I think if, if, I'm, if there's a consistent theme through what I write is I'm, I'm interested in this um, combination of the individuals and their times. I, mean, I don't think that individuals on their own make history, but I do think that you, at certain moments in history, get individuals who are able to ride the currents of history in a particular way or other, direct them in one way or the other. And I'm also interested in moments that actually do seem to change the world or change the, the, the future of the world. And I was interested in Chinese history. I used to teach it. I was also interested in the history of the Cold War. And it seemed to me that this moment in the Cold War where the United States went from an attitude of complete hostility to China and, and vice versa, really helped to transform the Cold War because it suddenly became a three-cornered relationship. It was no longer just the United States against, and its allies against the Soviet bloc. It was now a third player, China, which really, I think, made things very different. And I was also very interested in the characters of Mao and Nixon because I think, certainly in China, if Mao hadn't wanted improved relations with the United States, that wouldn't have happened. He, at that point in China, at the end of the 60s, beginning of the 70s, exercised such control over the major decisions. And on, on the other hand, I don't think if you'd had a different president, you would have had someone who could successfully have carried American opinion, opinion with him and persuaded enough Americans that it was the right thing and the sensible thing to do to have an American rapprochement with China. So I think the forces were there. It was probably going to happen but it may not have happened when it did without Nixon and Mao. And as it turned out, it was Nixon's best moment uh, yeah. in, a, in a troubled presidency. Mm -hmm. Now, the other book I wanted to refer to 
was your short but I thought terrific book on the uses and abuses of yeah. history. And it's something clearly you feel very strongly about. So I wanted to ask you a few years later uh, what still resonates with you from the experience of writing it. Well, if I were writing it now, I'd have a lot more examples. <laughs> the, the, the ways in which history is used, I mean, I think history can be used for uh, warning, like a signpost. You know, if you go into a country when they don't want you, you may run into trouble. Uh, you know, just simple warnings like that. It can help you to understand the people you're dealing with, because we're, we're formed, I think, and nations are too, in a very large part by our memories, by what's happened to us. And so if you want to understand Russia today, if you want to understand Putin today, you have to know something of Russian history to understand where he's coming from and why so many Russians support him. And so I think history is helpful like that, and I think history also is misused by statesmen and others who use it to justify what they want to do. I'm finding again more and more examples of you know, history teaches us that we should do this. Um, you know, we should invade Iraq because otherwise we'll get into all sorts of trouble. You know, if we don't, we should get involved in um, the affairs of other countries because otherwise all sorts of things will happen. So I do think that um, the general point I, I sort of was trying to make in that book that history can be both helpful in understanding but can also lead us into very um, dangerous policy decisions or very dangerous directions is one that's still valid today. And, and the ways in which countries use history against each other, you know, in, in the current um, ongoing dispute between China and Japan, mm. you get the Chinese very consciously using history. You know, the Japanese get committed brutalities against mm. us. We are therefore justified mm. in doing what we want to China. And I think you get increasingly the Japanese saying, well, wait a minute, the Chinese have also done things to mm. us. And so I think history does become a, a, a part of, a, of, of, of conflict between countries. Yes. And uh, also, in a sense, uh, history can help sometimes bring countries together. We saw that on the anniversary in Europe of the Second World War last year, where uh, Germany was included in uh, Allied celebrations. Yeah. I think it is important, and I think history can be a means of reconciliation. Um, I think what it means both sides have to be prepared to, to treat the other side's story as equally important. And there's going to be a very important um, ceremony in Gallipoli in April next week, in April 20, 24, 2015, where the Turks, the Australians, the French, the British, those who fought on different sides at Gallipoli during the First World War will actually be coming together to commemorate it. And I think this is a very good thing. This will be not a commemoration of we won, you lost. It will be a commemoration of people who fought in a cause and, and died. And, and I think be, a, be also a sad commemoration, a commemoration of the loss that all sides suffered in this. And so no, I do think it's very important to try and use history as, as a way of healing and a way of understanding each other and working together. Great. Margaret, thank you so much for being with us today in Tokyo. It's a great privilege for us. And for those listening to us or looking at us online, uh, I hope it gives you a sense of the sorts of issues that beyond our day-to-day -day work we're very interested in at UNU. We try to bring uh, valued friends and experts from around the world uh, to help educate us. And Margaret, you're, you're doing a wonderful job of that today. Well, it's a privilege to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me.